Hey there, Twisters. Nick here. Today, let's talk about the Tampa Bay Lightning and their Stanley Cup contention window. Is it actually closing now, or have they prolonged it at least for the time being? So let's dive into that. Let's look at free agency, the offseason, and the recent history for the Tampa Bay Lightning. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments down below. Is the window closing shut? Do you think there's still a contender out there? So comment down below. And if you're new here, welcome to Twisted Wrister Hockey. Definitely join our growing community here on YouTube by tapping that red subscribe button down below. This is your hub for all hockey analysis, history, and culture. Okay. So before I get into the minutia of this, here's just a high-level view on the Tampa Bay Lightning. Of course, won two of the past three Stanley Cups. They've reached at least the Eastern Conference Final six of the last eight years. That is wicked impressive. They still have a great core of players, even though they lost Andre Palat in free agency. Kucherov, Point, and Vasilevsky are all under 30 and just hitting the primes of their careers. And you also have, of course, Victor Hedman and Steven Stamkos, who was arguably the team's MVP over the course of the regular season and a really good contributor there in the postseason. And speaking of which, after really watching that postseason run, I saw that there were certainly some offensive holes on that team, even from the backside, as Hedman was not quite featured as much offensively there. And you also had, of course, guys like Sorelli and Point uh, just completely disappearing offensively, even though they got some chances, they were snake bit to say the least. I thought that maybe after a run like that, that they could potentially trade out somebody like Alex Kalorn, where they're a very good defensive team, the Lightning are, and perhaps upgrade and get somebody a little bit more fresh into that top six or the middle six of that team, and maybe get a little bit more mobile on defense as well. So here's what they've done in the offseason. And when I look at this, I kind of assess to myself, are they a team that can compete next year? So first of all, they made some big changes on their defense. So they traded away Ryan McDonough. He still had four years left on a 6.75 uh, annual cap hit. So that is quite a bit. And so it was wise to move them out while they're still defensively a pretty strong team with guys like Victor Hedman and Eric Chernak. So they got Philippe Myers in that trade. He's only 25 years old. Um, they lost Jan Ruta in free agency to Pittsburgh, but they brought in Ian Cole, a very experienced depth defenseman, one year at $3 million. Also signed Hayden Fleury to kind of be a spot starter, you know, seventh or eighth defenseman, two years at basically league minimum. So overall, I still think that their defense looks excellent. The actual blue liners, they can play to John Cooper's system, I would have to say. However, of course, the big loss here was offensively in the likes of Andre Palat, a guy who might not put the puck in the net a ton in the regular season, but in this in the postseason, the last three postseason runs, this guy's been absolutely money and carried the team a couple points in this last playoffs. So in his past 71 postseason games, that's over the span of the last three playoffs, he does have 27 goals, which is a big uptick from what you get out of him in the regular season. So what did they do to, to offset that or to make up for that? Well, first of all, they brought in Vladislav Nemesnikov, a 29-year-old who started his career in Tampa and was a top six weapon for them at times. In 62 games in the 2017-18 season, he had 20 goals. That's still pretty darn good for a guy who didn't have that much NHL experience under his belt. But he's kind of evolved more to a middle six role or even a third line role. This past season, he played for both the Red Wings and the Stars. He fit in nicely there with Dallas. 75 games, 16 goals, 14 assists for 30 points. So... It wasn't exactly an upgrade over Palat or anything near to match that. And it will be interesting to see if Nemesnikov still has something in the tank to where he could maybe play on a top line. But you think about the season that Ross Colton recently had. This guy played his first full NHL season, 79 games. He put up 22 goals. I had no idea he had scored that many, especially when you consider he didn't average any more than 13 minutes of time on ice per game. So he can also contribute in the playoffs. I, I would be keen to see him actually move into the top line. So you lose Palat, you move Colton up. The guy's still pretty young. He's coming into his own. So the way that I look at this team going into next year, you could potentially have a first line with Stamkos, Kucherov, and Colton. Second line, you have Point. Yeah, he'll be healthy again with Alex Kalorn and Anthony Sorelli. So a very defensive-oriented uh, second line with some scoring upside. Third line, this is a result of free agency and the trade deadline from this past season. Nick Paul, we'll talk about his extension, Brandon Hagel, and Vladislav Nemesnikov. So I actually like that third line quite a bit, especially if Hagel and Paul can continue uh, their successes there in Tampa. Fourth line, very familiar, uh, Belmar with Pat Maroon 
and also Corey Perry. Um, they each have a year left on their deals. But being the Lightning, they could certainly complement their core by um, you know, finding a different role player out there, maybe moving on from a guy like Alex Kalorn and bringing in a guy for a little bit cheaper who's a little more young and help him kind of grow into that role with some of the veterans they have. So they still have options, and I wouldn't put it past them to look like a better team once we get to the trade deadline next season, circumvent the cap a little bit, and um, maybe look like a better club than what we were expecting heading into next year's playoffs. But now let's talk about the long term. So I was really interested to see what Julian Breezebois did here because it's almost like they see this next group of players sort of taking the reins two or three years from now and being potentially as good as the team that we see right now. I don't necessarily agree with Julian Breezebois on these decisions, but let's dive into them and talk about what each player has to offer here. So let's start with Nick Paul here. He's 27 years old, a seven-year deal. And that's a lot for a guy to play in a middle six role. $3.15 million annually. Now, that deal could actually mature quite well because Paul, at times, was the best forward, I think, for the Lightning in the playoffs when they couldn't have a goal out there. Uh, he certainly played a couple of different roles while Braden Point was injured. So I always liked him in Ottawa. I saw some scoring upside there, but I saw a more well-rounded, complete game from him when he came to the Tampa Bay Lightning. So it's even though it's a long-term deal, for 3.15 mil, for a guy who could still play maybe a second-line role for you in a couple of years or even in this season if somebody gets hurt, I don't think that's a bad gamble at all. But now we get into three players who got absolutely paid. They were pending RFAs for next year, but in this case, Julian Breezebois extended them to big, big deals. So the first one is Eric Chernak. He's only 25 years old, and I do like Chernak. He has a lot of experience under his belt already at this age. But at eight years, at $5.2 million annually, that is a fairly hefty contract for a guy who's mostly a stay-at-home defenseman. But I like his fundamentals. He takes good care of the puck. He's physical when he needs to be. So it's not the worst deal out there. I'd rather see something like this than what the Sharks did with Mark Edward Vlasic when they signed him to a 7x7 seven seven deal. So Chernak, maybe this contract could age fairly well. He's just hitting the prime of his career. So overall, it might be an actual smart investment for this team. The next player we'll talk about is center slash winger Anthony Sorelli. He's only 25 years old. He was inked to an eight-year deal at $6.25 million. That is a lot for a guy who didn't really show up much on the score sheet in the postseason. But Sorelli's defense is tremendous. I would have to say that he's probably one of the best 5 to 10 players defensively in the NHL, not counting goaltenders. That's how skilled he is at taking the puck away, how much of a weapon he is in the neutral zone. So I don't mind this deal that much either considering what he offers in sort of all three zones. But the thing is, is that he needs some talent around him if you know his line is to produce out there. And he will be expected to produce in that role if he is playing on the second line. I don't see why he wouldn't be going forward. He had 17 goals and 26 assists for 43 points in the regular season. That's certainly acceptable, and hopefully he can build on that. But he has to turn it around for the next postseason or two. And the last player I'll talk about here is Mikhail Sergachev, 24-year-old defenseman left shot. Eight-year deal at $8.5 million annually. So I instantly think of the Roman Yossi contract. Yossi makes $9.5 million, I want to say. And he puts the team on his back night after night with the minutes that he logs, the situations that he's playing out there on the ice, and carrying the team in terms of leading them in points this past season. So can Sergachev be the kind of player who you know, leads his team in scoring and quarterbacks the power play starting next year or the year after? I personally am not sold on that so far. He's been getting more opportunity, more ice time, and certainly that means he's going to be exposed to more situations out there. But over the course of you know 10 games or 20 games, I haven't seen Sergachev be you know that number one defenseman in the making per se. He's been critical of himself. He's talked about what he really does need to work on. You know, turnovers are certainly one of those facets. Uh, but yeah, I just, I, I don't quite see eye to eye with Breezebois on this one yet. Maybe they should have waited until next season first half of the season to see how he pans out. So how do I evaluate these three deals? All right, well, first of all, I look at the playoffs because when I think of Sergachev and Sorelli, I think of two players who should be contributing a little bit here and there who went absolutely stone cold. So they combined with Chernak in the playoffs, just six goals and 14 assists among them. So I think to myself, how does that really warrant a deal, especially with Sorelli and with Sergachev when they're supposed to be producing offensively according to these contracts, right? So 
let's say it's two or three years from now, Hedman's a little bit older, Stamkos is a little bit older, you know, or Braden Point's hurt, right? How does Sorelli become a 55 or 60 point producer? How does Sergachev be a 55 point producer, right? What can we say about them right now is a prelude to what they're going to offer for this franchise going forward, other than their defensive capabilities, right? So I'm not, that's the reason why I am being a little bit critical here. I think that Brisebois is really banking on the salary cap rising a lot over the next few years so that these deals look a lot more valuable. And you also have to consider here that Breezebaugh partially did this because he wants to make sure he's investing in players who have had some success with this club. So then that way they're not necessarily, you know, watching guys like Barkley Goodrow and Yanni, well, Yanni Gordova's expansion draft, but Blake Coleman, let's just say him as well. Those kinds of impact players walk away in free agency. So what he's doing right now is he's saying, okay, well, we don't have the prospect pool. You know, the prospect pool was ranked 30th earlier this year in the athletics. So he's committing these longer term deals so that that gives them time to potentially build the prospect pool, especially if they don't trade out, you know, first or a second round draft pick. Look at their draft picks. It doesn't look particularly good. So I do understand from that perspective that these players have to be counted on while, you know, it's almost like he's being as resourceful as possible. That's kind of the way that I see it. But the thing is, is that I haven't seen enough offensive impact from this team and then you lose Palat you're not entirely sure what you're going to get from Nemesnikov if you're going to put him in the top six role and Paul I hope he's more than just a flash in the pan I don't think that he will be like that though I think he's going to get better so what I see happening here the Lightning banking on these players to sort of complement the core and kind of reshape it over the next three or four seasons right while you know Vasilevsky and Kucherov are playing out their prime is that going to be enough I think that they'll need some youth. They'll need some more speed, I think, out there as well. And that's going to be especially crucial, I think, going forward. You know, look at this division, this Atlantic division. It's had such an interesting offseason with the way that the Senators all of a sudden kind of stacked themselves with guys like Alex Dabrinkit entering the lineup, with the way the Buffalo Sabres really came together as a team under Don Granado last year. With the way that, of course, the Red Wings uh, were very aggressive in free agency, getting players like Andrew Kopp and David Perron. There are a couple others. Ben Sherratt was part of that, too. And how the Canadians, they have like a bazillion draft picks going forward and a couple of franchise cornerstones in guys like Caulfield, Suzuki, and now uh, Uri Slavkovsky. So for Tampa, they have to expect that this is going to not only produce results for the next couple of years with this strong core, but that a player like Sergeyev is going to take over, that a player like Sorelli is going to find his consistent scoring touch. So I don't know if I necessarily buy into that, but this is what Breezebaugh felt he had to do with the way that you know the salary cap era works. And so he's going to bank on his own players versus uh, just trying to uh, be the highest bidder on a couple of free agents out there. And as I mentioned earlier, he can always get very creative with some of the trades that he makes. A lot of those have panned out quite well for them. So Overall, looking at the Lightning here, I still think that they're quite a good team for the next couple of seasons, maybe two or three years. Down the line, though, I'm going to need to see more from guys like Sergeyev, Sorelli, uh, maybe somebody like Ross Colton, as I was talking about earlier, to really make this team a threat in all three zones. I I still think that with Vasilevsky, they are just a tremendous defensive team, and with a couple of the forwards that they have there, but at the end of the day, they need to put the puck in the net, and they certainly showed some struggles Uh, during this past postseason run. So anyway, what are your thoughts on the Tampa Bay Lightning going forward? What does their Stanley Cup contention window look like? You guys sound off down below. Hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, please do hit the thumbs up. And if you're new, of course, subscribe. In the meantime, before you uh, watch some of my other content that I'll upload shortly here on YouTube, you can follow me on social media. I've got my uh, Twitter and my Instagram down there. So thank you guys so much for watching. Once again, I'm Nick, and I'll catch you twisters later. Ciao.